in this session, making the grade and examination of the region's export performance. We're going to look at the possibilities of trade expansion as one of the tools of uh, achieving sustainable and resilient growth in the Caribbean. The moderator for this panel is His Excellency Ambassador Mikhail Barford. The presenter will be Mrs. Pamela Koch Hamilton. And our panelist, and I will not do the, the reviews of the panelists in the interest of time, since they are already described in your programs, Mr. Ashish Shah, Director of the Division of Country Programs International Trade, Mr. Vassal Stewart, the President of the Caribbean Agribusiness Association, and Professor Victor Bulmer Thomas, Honorary Professor at the University College London, Professor Emeritus of London University. So, to our presenter, Mrs. Pamela Coke Hamilton, as we lead off the discussion with the role of moderator, Ambassador Mikhail Barford. Stay here? Or? Yes, you can stay. Okay. Here we go. Can you all hear me now? Very good. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much. And um, I'm very uh, honored to be on this panel here, uh, which is going to, to discuss the, um, the region's export performance. I think we have uh, covered different perspectives of the issue. Uh, of course, uh, Pamela needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever. Um, and the other panelists, they cover, uh, first of all, um, Ashis, the general international trade promotion. Uh, who, he's an expert on strategic planning. And then we have um, uh, Vassil, who brings us down to the sector perspective. He's an expert in one particular sector, agribusiness. And I hope you will be able to bring on lots of very nice examples for us that will make this panel discussion um, okay. um, more concrete. And then last but not least, um, we have um, Victor, Professor Victor Balmer thomas And like uh, in any panel, of course, you need academia here as well. Yeah. And uh, academia here in, in terms of Victor is, is most welcome because he's written many books on the, uh, on the region. And he can bring in the uh, economic history perspective as well, which is very, very useful for this debate here. Um, now, um, I would just like to say uh, a few uh, words before I, um, I leave the floor to, to Pamela, uh, Coke Hamilton. Uh, we all know, uh, and basically three points if you like, we all know that Cariforum countries, with the exception of Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Suriname, are predominantly service exporters. Um, and um, although all Cariforum uh, countries, they do export goods, it's only the export baskets of Trinidad and Tobago and the Dominican Republic that actually reflect goods as the majority of exports. That's one very important phenomenon for me. Um, the other one is that um, if we look at the uh, export statistics as a whole, uh, then um, the exports have grown by 4.3% for the region between 2008 and 2013, and then they stagnated between 2012 and 13. And this compares to an overall growth of 50% in the expansion of world uh, exports from 2009 to 13, um, and, uh, and, and a stagnation the last couple of years. Um. So generally speaking, and that's the, the, the third point, um, over the period 2008 to 13, there was a diversification in the destination markets. Um, and previously, two-thirds of the exports from the Caribbean went to the United uh, States and the European Union. Uh, but now that has gone down to about half. An interesting phenomenon as well that we need to deal with. And then lastly, I would like to slightly abuse my position as a moderator in order to give you some heading, slightly provocative perhaps, on the strengths and weaknesses um, of um, Cariforum exports. And, and these uh, points can then hang in the air, uh, or you can ignore them. It's up to you, panelist. <laughs> but amongst the strength, I would say you have the product uniqueness. 
amongst the strength you have the quality rather than the price and amongst the strength you have trade in services is more resilient than trade in goods, less dependent on, on trade financing, etc. For instance, creative industries. Amongst the weaknesses, um, there are, of course, limited export capacity to meet increased export demand. There is low productivity due to deficiencies in, in human capital. Amongst weaknesses are also um, high production costs, high cost of electricity, in some cases climate security and high interest rates. Another weakness is port inefficiency and unreliability and uncertainty. And then you have uh, weak infrastructure, roads, transportation and sanitary labs in some cases. On the opportunities, there are several niche markets that are waiting to be exploited, so particularly in the creative industries, music, publishing, visual arts and film. And I'm sure that um, Pamela Cook Hamilton might come back to that subject. And on the weaknesses as well, there is, of course, languages, because the region speaks a lot of Spanish and, and, and French, not to mention a little bit of Dutch as well. So there you are. Um, I will now uh, pass the floor to our main presenter. Pamela, please, if you could. Can I stand up? You can do whatever you like. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous invitation to give <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I'm supposed to click this, right? Is it click? Click. Is it loaded? Ah, there you go. Yeah. Sorry. Go back one. Ah, I point it there. Okay. Not there. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> What I wanted to do was just set the context uh, for our discussions over the next two days and also to just uh, what we give what I call a report card. Caribbean export was given the mandate and has had it for the last 18 years for increasing exports uh, or uh, helping the private sector increase exports uh, from the region. And we've developed numerous mechanisms over the years uh, to try to address that and to attain that objective. The challenge is how do we know whether those mechanisms are working? What are the indices for measurement? And so we decided that do the indicators show that the, we meet the targets? And we decided that any intervention, of course, must be based on, a, on an analysis of where we are um, and what is the ecosystem within which Caribbean exporters operate. So once we've done this, then we can tailor our work uh, to meet the exporters where they are. And as we move towards the end of the implementation of the 10th EDF and begin to uh, reassess our work program, we want to be able to be agile enough to explore and facilitate new windows of opportunity. Uh, as the ambassador mentioned, what are those new areas? What are the potential areas? And how do we move ahead? So we'll just start with an economic uh, overview of the region. Economic growth for the region is projected at 2.5%, which is down from 3% uh, um, for the last few years. So it's declined by about 0.5% slightly. The regional GDP is US 132 billion. Of course, DR is the largest, uh, with Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Barbados following. Uh, DR is uh, 80, well, sorry. DR actually is now, um, followed by Trinidad and Tobago, of course. Trinidad is 82.83% uh, highest GDP uh, to export to GDP ratio. Um, Guyana is 37, Suriname 22.59, and Belize 21.65. We all know the fiscal deficits that the, the many countries in the region are facing, including, of course, Jamaica, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Grenada, among others. Three CARIFORUM countries scored in the top 100 of global competitiveness report. Uh, these three were Barbados, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Jamaica. And finally, seven CARIFORUM countries scored in the top 100 in the Ease of Doing Business Index. Importantly, and I think significantly, Jamaica jumped 27 places this year, um, simply by changing a few things. 
And I think that's an incredible statement about how effective putting in place the proper regulatory mechanisms and administrative mechanisms to enhance business can be within one year. 27 places is a huge leap. So congratulations, Jamaica. <laughs> The trade overview of the region, the total exports for us was uh, 51 billion uh, US dollars. Services account for 62% of those exports, which also uh, points significantly to where we should be looking in terms of creating the ecosystem for uh, trade and export. Interestingly, the between 2009 and 2013, and these, these figures are highly skewed, I should say, but our exports grew by, to the EU by 2%, um, Latin America by 41%, and to North America by 11%, and intra-regionally by 9%. The 41% to Latin America is more to do with oil and petrochemicals, so that skews it quite a bit. Good news is that the average growth rate for CARIFORUM is higher than that of all the other regions, um, which suggests that we are growing and which suggests that there is positive outlook here. Um, the regional exports, of course, are concentrated in agro-products and the creative industries. I wanted to make this point about trade agreements. Approximately 25% of the region's trade takes place under bilateral trade agreements. Uh, the corollary of that is that 75% does not. <laughs> and, and what does that tell us? Is that something that we should think about in terms of how we approach trade agreements. Do they work for us? Are we going to continue to engage in them? Are we utilizing them effectively? Is that the problem? Or are we simply ignoring them? And I think these are the, some of the discussions that we need to have as we move forward. Okay, these are the key carry forum exports. On the traditional, we divide them to traditional and non-traditional. Of course, energy, agriculture, mining, quarrying, and, and of course, tourism and travel and the services are the, are the traditional. But in the non-traditional areas, you'll note that the petrochemical sector, once again, is, is 20 billion, with a growth of 23%. Agro-processing is 2.2 billion, which outpaces the 1.4 billion in the agriculture sector, which is raw commodities. And I think that's very important, and I'd like Vassal to speak to this after, because the potential in agro-processing is an incredible one. And I think we need to really move on that and move on it as quickly as we can. Light manufacturing, the growth in furniture, uh, wooden furniture in particular, is also notable. Industrial exports, of course, linked to iron and steel. The cultural industry is 482 million, but in a way I think that that is under-reported because I think we just don't have the figures, and we need to get the figures. Um, on services, transport, communication, professional, education services is 20 billion and grew by 12%. That's just a nice pie chart, which I insisted be in because I like pie charts. <laughs> it basically just shows what it is that uh, I have just indicated. The performance of the agro-processing sector, we're looking at, as we indicated, 2.2 billion, representing 7% of global exports for the region. The main exports, of course, are sugar, food preparations, sugar, confectionery, fruits and nuts, beverages and spirits, North America, Europe, and intra-regional. There is a huge opportunity in two areas. One, to expand the base of our products, to diversify that base. How do we begin to look at other areas? What are we doing in cocoa? What are we doing in terms of um, cassava? Africa. Africa is now one of the, well, West Africa, Nigeria, got our largest growing markets right now. And we don't have to sell them on our culture because our cultures are very similar. The foods that they eat are very similar. What they demand we already supply. So I think that is an area that we, we need to begin to look at in terms of diversifying away from our traditional markets, which are continuing to shrink, um, and moving towards newer markets as well. 
as I was indicating, I don't know if you can read this, but Cariforum supplies seven of the 10 highest demanded products in Africa, as compared to only three of the 10 highest demanded in Europe, four of the 10 highest demanded in North America, three of the 10 highest demand in Latin America, four of the 10 in intra cariforum trade, and four of 10 out in Asia, which in a way emphasizes the point that the demand out of Africa could be huge. And I just wanted to also point out that Grace Kennedy has set up in, in Ghana and is going into Nigeria, is that right, Jimmy? And therefore, there is an opportunity there to collaborate with companies, regional companies that are already there and the opportunities that they can present for distribution of product. Regional GDP total, we're looking at Cariform Goods Exports contribution to GDP. You will note the skewing. The regional GDP is 132 billion, this is goods, and the regional average is 17% contribution to GDP. Only four countries were above that average. And of course, we know who those four countries are, Trinidad, Guyana, Belize, and Jamaica. The OECS, notably, as we all know, are all below, except for St. Kitts and Nevis, which is at 11.61%. All are below 10%, um, with Antigua and Barbuda at the lowest at 2%, which, of course, uh, just confirms that we know that OECS are services-dominated economies, and therefore we'll have to work on the, the economic and infrastructure for promoting services. This just goes on to look at the creative industries, the performance, and the key export markets. Now we know that this is a 1.1 billion, sorry, I shouldn't say that, it's a trillion dollar market, and our culture sells, and we know that our culture sells. The issue is how do we create a branding platform that sells the Caribbean? And is this something that we can do together? Is it something that we need to do singly? And how do we take advantage of, of a platform that allows us to do that? The other issue is, of course, our performance rights revenues. This grew by 19% to US 1.1 billion, but the Caribbean still continues to not be able to collect I'd say 90 odd percent of our royalties and because we don't have the infrastructure in place and the monetary mechanisms to do that, the enforcement. And I think that is critical because if we are going to be talking about creative industries and if we're going to be talking about enhancing our ability to take advantage of a huge market, then we need to put in place the mechanisms and the in infrastructure to do this. The tourism sector, we all know, is the largest in terms of services, 28 billion. But interestingly, in, in point number three, you'll notice that the growth in arrivals from South America grew by 13% last year, which also indicates that there needs to be a shift in our tourism marketing. My opinion is, and this is purely my opinion, it does not represent the views of Caribbean Export or the board. <laughs> this is purely my opinion. We continue to sell tourism in the same way we sold tourism 50 years ago. I was in a, in a, where was I? Some store. And I saw a poster. And the poster was done in 1955. And except for the grain of the, of the paper, it could be the exact same poster that we're using now. The world has shifted, and we have to shift our tourism product to reflect that shift. We've got to start training our tour guides and our tour operators and others in languages, in Spanish, in French, in Dutch, we need to start looking towards non-traditional markets. We keep you know, talking about, the last time I was in the airport and there was a cruise ship leaving here to, to go back, um, well, the flight was leaving after a cruise uh, of Londoners, well, British. All of them were over 70. There was not one with black hair. 
And it, it says to you that it is a dying constituency and we need to find a different way. I'm not saying that we can't focus on the UK market, but we need to focus in a different way and on a different set of, of variables because it's dying and we need to, to be honest about that. The regional average CARIFORM services exports contribution to GDP. Of course, for Antigua and Barbuda and, and Bahamas, it's the highest, 59% and 52% respectively. Um, and I think this is important because it talks about the fact that the regional average for services value added as a percentage of GDP was 69%. So basically 70% of the contribution to GDP in the region is from services. And I think that that uh, is important to, to recognize. This just gives you a, a, a pictorial, a snapshot of the comparison, car, comparator between CARIFORM exports contribution to GDP, goods and services. Goods is the green, services is the blue. You will note the disproportionality in the OECS countries of services towards the right. And then, of course, Trinidad and Tobago with goods. Uh, but virtually all the countries, except for Suriname, Dominican Republic, and Trinidad and Tobago, um, have services as their largest contributor to export performance. <clears throat> I wanted to just note this simply because our Regional exports to Africa have declined by 24%, but have grown by 20% to Europe, 10% to North America, 41% to Latin America, and 52% to Asia. Now I need to put a codicil on the Asia and the Latin America. The Latin America was due to a 260% increase in the export of petrochemicals from Trinidad and Tobago, and the increase in Asia was also due to petrochemicals from Trinidad and Tobago. So that skewed those numbers quite significantly. Taking those out, it would not be higher than possibly 5%, 10%. Average exports growth rate per region, as I indicated earlier, Cari Forum has actually the highest uh, average export growth rate between 2009 to 2013 among all the regions um, across the world. So what are our potential growth sectors for the region? The first one, of course, is the creative and cultural industries. Um, it's estimated by PricewaterhouseCoopers that US, it's a US 1.8 trillion in 2010. And I'm sure it has grown since that and has generated 654 billion euros and contributed 2.6% of the EU's GDP. And that was 2003. I want to make a major push and, and a plea, I'm not sure who I'm pleading to, but anyway, a plea for the statistics. We cannot continue to talk about services and creative industries and the need for the region to focus and the need for us to move in this area. And we don't have the numbers. Minister, it's kind of like going to an election and you don't know whether you're going to win or lose. I mean, how do you know? How can you put in place mechanisms? How can you put in place policies? How can you, if you don't have the numbers, we're just shooting in the dark. And we really need, as, as countries who clearly show that services exports are going to be and continue to be the largest contributor to foreign exchange earnings and to economic growth, we have to get the numbers, we have to get the statistics, we have to be able to define which areas are the fastest growing, which ones should we focus on, which ones should drive our economic agenda. And we, we really don't know. And I, I really think that that is critical. Agro-processed products. This exceeds $1 billion annually in the US alone and has grown globally at 9.3% annually over the past decade. This, of course, is due to demographic changes. The United States is now almost 50% Latino. Don't tell them that, but. <laughs> um, 
And so you have a huge Latin America population, you have a large diaspora, Caribbean diaspora, and so the shift in taste is already occurring and hence the demand. This is a market that we are not taking advantage of at all, minimally. Why? I think that's a question that needs to be discussed and I'll leave it to the, the esteemed panelists to discuss it. But I think it's, a, in, it's an area that we need to look at in terms of joint distribution, joint warehousing, and possibly a single brand. Because if we're going to look at hot sauce as a potential export market, and we're talking a billion US market, why can't we do it? Um, the next, I, I, in, I mentioned this already, the furniture. The largest uh, producers, of course, are Guyana, Suriname, and Belize. But this is a $117 billion market as well. And because of the new push towards using natural woods, and it's become a major growth market. And this is an area that we can take advantage of as well. And uh, the Caribbean grew by 617% in terms of exports in, in the last uh, five years. Financial services, we know what that's about. We know the threats to it, and we know what we need to do. Uh, we're in the process of forming a financial services secretariat at the moment, and we are looking at the creation of an institute that will look at issues of advocacy and training. But that's 148 million US from the region. That was the value, but that does not include Cayman, which is three trillion. This 148 million is only Bahamas, Barbados, and uh, Antigua and Barbuda to some extent. But it's a, it's a trillion dollar market and we know this. And of course, renewable energy. There are various elements of, of renewable energy that we can look at. Um, we all know what they are. Uh, we supported the uh, creation of, of um, power, power places, power charging stations for uh, a company here. And they have grown from a 30,000 euro grant from Caribbean export to a US $1 million market already within one year. It says something about the potential and how this area can also help reduce our costs. The current performance in potential export sectors. We just spoke about this. Uh, creative goods is 482 million. I do not think that that figure is actually representative, but it's what we have. Agro-process, 2.2 billion, and financial services, 148 million. I also think that that is underreported. So potential new export markets. In Africa, you look at the agro-processing um, area. The largest demanded products are sugar. So sugar is not dead, actually. We just need to shift where we send it. So <laughs> perhaps we can look at sugar again. You never know. But the point is that the demand for sugar, soya bean oil, non-alcoholic beverage, and we didn't put here cassava, but that's also a huge opportunity. Agro-processing for the region could be cacao, as the Spanish call it, or cocoa, as we call it. Um, spirits and liqueurs, uh, tobacco products, and of course, sugar. I understand that they were going to put a $250 million sugar factory here. <laughs> right, Derek? So <laughs> But at any rate, uh, that's, that's a possibility. The EU uh, agro-processing area is bread, biscuits, chocolates, juices, but the truth is I, I would prefer that we move more towards the creative industry, jewelry, handbags, wooden furniture, uh, metal. But our growth in jewelry also was, was pretty significant. It was over 600% as well for, for EU. Latin America, alcoholic beverages, bread, biscuits, wafers, fruits, perfumes. Um, North America, hot sauces. Uh, and then Asia, sugar, bread, biscuits, etc. So we, we, we're identifying the areas that we think could move and move quickly. Um, this does not, of course, include technology and innovation. And we, we look forward to hearing from Mr. Chris Singh and others on that panel with respect to the growth in that area. What we thought we'd look at as well is the effectiveness of trade agreements. When we look at this chart, you'll note that the exports to our trade partners, for the most part, is very, very low. 
except the European Union, 16.997% uh, trade agreement as a percentage of total CARICOM exports. So that's good, right, Ambassador? See, that's positive. You can take that back to the EU and say, give us more money. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> we, uh, that is the, that's the largest growth area, and it tells you uh, pro a few things. It either tells you one that it doesn't make sense we continue to negotiate these agreements because they are a waste of time, or that we are not utilizing the potential presented by these agreements for accessing these markets. And I think the latter is actually true. I think it is that our private sector has not found a way to effectively utilize the market opening in these agreements to, to um, enhance our exports. And that's something that we need to look at and to look at the implementation deficit. Why is it that this is happening? This is just some figures that show the carry form export to the EU 20, 2004 to 2012. As you'll see, there was a major dip in after the 2008 recession, um, but it began to rise again. The, the, the overall blue is including Dominican Republic, of course. And Dominican Republic, as we know, has tripled their exports to the EU under the EPA. Um, Jamaica increased as well, has gone down a little bit, but has increased. But OECS, for the most part, has been on a downward trend. And we need to look at why that is and how we can make it work. You'll notice the performance on the trade agreements as well on the EPA. Goods, we have a negative trade balance for all three years. But in services, our trade balance is positive. And that should also guide us on how we should be engaging the EU market and utilizing the EPA. So, constraints facing export growth in CARI Forum. There are several constraints. We know this, um, but I just wanted to list them. The first is access to finance. And for several reasons. Our banks are very traditional and risk averse. Um, I always tell people if Google and Facebook were invented in the Caribbean, it would die. We wouldn't, we <laughs> because our banks tend not to be able to ascribe value to an idea. They don't know how to measure it and they don't know how to put in place the mechanisms to, to, to make it work. And so what we have to be looking at is non-traditional forms of of uh, capital and, and investment. That will be discussed in another panel on access to finance, but that's an important area because it creates significant difficulties for many of our, our younger entrepreneurs. Branding and intellectual property rights. We still have poor value capture. Um, our capacity to enforce and to implement the, the laws it continues to be a struggle. But uh, we'll also be talking about that. We have a, our representative from WIPO here, director of the Caribbean uh, section, I think it is, um, as well as other persons who work in the field. The regulatory framework, that's, as we know, the whole ecosystem within which private sector operates. The doing business is the measurement of that. And we recognize that that needs to change, and we'll be working with the governments to try to see how we can enhance the ability of the private sector to operate in a, in a more friendly ecosystem. The lack of innovation. <laughs> um, we have low investment in research and development. I think I read somewhere once where less than 1% of most private sector entities invest in R&D. Less than 1%. And so you can't move if you're not innovating. In addition to which, uh, my, my pet peeve, uh, and it's my son's birthday today, and Julian's. Happy birthday, Julian. Mm -hmm. Julian Rogers. <laughs> um, our education system is, has not evolved to address the new global environment. I was helping a friend of mine wrap books for her son. And they're still using the people who came. And, uh, and those are, you know, our age. Uh, my son doesn't recognize what a typewriter is. We went to a store and he's saying to me, Mom, what's that? And I'm looking and saying, what? What is it that he couldn't recognize in here? And he says, that. And I said, what? He says, that thing. 
I looked at it. It was a typewriter. He had never seen a typewriter in his life. And that tells you where the children nowadays are. But we still have them sitting behind a desk, taking notes and regurgitating. It's not working. And if we don't change our education system, we will continue to fall behind. That's my pet peeve, sorry. Standards. I think most of the countries now understand the critical need for meeting the standards in order to access the market. And we're helping countries do this through various mechanisms. But this is very important. It is costly, and once again, we go back to the issue of access to finance. Um, logistics and shipping. I will leave that to the panel on clearing the hurdles. <laughs> I think, I think that, that's a bigger thing than me. It's above my pay grade. That one is, uh, I asked Minister Boyce about the people who are liated. Um, it's a verb, liated because it means you were subject to liat. Uh, it took me two days, it's liated, you know. I was liated, I, I went to the airport on Saturday, I did not get back here till Sunday evening. Um, one hour flight from Guyana. So what I'm saying is that we need to look at the reality of our region. Finally, market intelligence. This is an area that we've been working in assiduously as Caribbean export, but it continues to be a weakness. And what I'd like to suggest is we find a mechanism through which we can more effectively assist the private sector in getting access to market intelligence and to, to really targeting key markets, not just general numbers, but key targets that they can then pursue. All right, the report card. Did we pass, did we fail? Okay, economic performance, these are completely Caribbean exports responsibility. Uh, so, you feel free to disagree. Economic performance, we give a B minus. Uh, there has been sustained overall economic growth since the crisis, actually. We've done very well. Goods and services have grown by 17 and 12% respectively in 2013. Um, exports grew in excess of 10%, uh, except for Africa. Fiscal deficit and external debt are still high, but there are measures in place to address this. And seven out of Ten, seven out of the Cariforum countries uh, scored in the top 100, and of course, we indicated Jamaica go, uh, jumped by 27 places. On export competitiveness, we gave a C because of the fact that exports are concentrated still in a few products, um, outside of energy, of course, and markets, and their weak linkages to the global value chains and regional value chains are not being developed. There's also the supply side constraint. We continue to have supply side issues. And we were talking about that at breakfast. Um, the fact that most of our companies, uh, or most of our agro processes, for example, the hoteliers will not take from uh, the farmers because there's a lack of consistency of supply. The same is true in the artisanal world. We'll get orders from Donna Karan or, or Martha Stewart, but we can't meet the supply. And as a result, we lose the business. It is not lack of quality. It is our inability to consistently meet the demand of businesses that require consistency. Um, export diversification. Once again, uh, our export portfolio and our markets are still relatively undiversified, except for a few areas. We still are doing what we did 50 years ago. Um, and we have to find a way to move beyond that. Um, still dominated services by, by tourism. And we have not evolved out of that. So on cross-sectoral issues, the role of private sector in development. This C, I hope, will move to an A once Jimmy has been able to put in place <laughs> his mechanism to, to, to establish the Caribbean uh, Business Council, which then will re-engage at the regional level in a, in a very proactive way, we hope, the, the role of the private sector in, in, in engaging with government. The need for the PPD framework is, is integral because the role of the private sector is what drives government to make changes in policy. Branding and intellectual property, I put a C minus, uh, mainly because we, we still continue to have weak national enforcement mechanisms, um, and there are some countries who still have not even recognized IP rights as something that ought to be 
included. So um, access to finance, C minus, uh, we have been trying various methods to, to get funding. Uh, we've signed some agreements with, with development banks and we're looking at the formation of angel investment networks um, and possibly other, other crowdfunding and uh, non-traditional mechanisms. On innovation, we put a D, and I already indicated why. Conform conformity, sorry, to international standards. We put a B minus because, maybe because it was externally pushed, but the FSMA and others certainly pushed us <laughs> to force the region to begin to recognize the need for meeting international standards in order to access the EU and other markets. The FSMA, HACCP, ISO, et cetera. Um, finally, global logistics and shipping. Uh, for the external environment, we gave a C plus. Uh, in other words, the ability to get to Miami, uh, probably because most of us shop there, is not a problem, um, <laughs> or to New York or anywhere else. Getting to London is very easy. I, got, I could have gotten to London quicker than I got back here from Guyana. I could have gotten to London and come back, and, <laughs> and it would have been fine. That's not a problem. But the intra-regional, we give an F. Uh, we, we have to address it. it. It is bedeviling the region and the regional private sector. And uh, if we don't address it, everything else becomes, frankly, Theoretical. So that is my presentation. Um, I would appreciate any comments. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I leave the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Pamela Cook Hamilton for a very thorough presentation of export trends, constraints, and opportunities. It was packed with uh, facts, and I'm certainly going to keep a copy for reference, and maybe some of you will do the same thing. Um, I think it is very important to uh, how to get the most out of the export uh, platform, uh, how to shift with the rest of the world, like Pamela said, uh, how to focus the export drive on, on promising markets, um, and how important it is for exporters to think strategically. The only thing I would add is that in your ideal tourist post, post uh, Pamela, you were talking about including people with black hair. Um, I think that's a good idea, but it is, there's another addition I'd like to, to make. That is, you also need to include people with gray hair. Yes, yes. Because <laughs> a few. baby boomers, they have gray hair. Yes, lots of them. And I'm sorry, but I know what I'm talking about because yes. I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> No and offense, there is, no offense. In okay, business. and there is an export market there, that's why yes, I mentioned it, not is. because yes. I'm offended, not at all. I know. All right. <laughs> right, so without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to, um, to Mr. Ashish Shah. Ashish, you have the floor for a brief uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, excellencies. And first of all, um, thank you Pamela for uh, an extremely uh, vivid and very clear uh, presentation. It is a bit of a daunting challenge to come in after you, um, and also uh, a bit daunting because it's a bit difficult to contradict what you said. Oh good, thank you. That being said, <laughs> numbers are numbers, exactly. and you can show numbers to show the boom, and you can show numbers to show the gloom. So my job today, um, as the first panelist on this session, is perhaps to be a little bit provocative and maybe um, give a slightly more nuanced view about what we have um, heard today. I would just, uh, this is more really in the, in the spirit of um, animating some discussion and debate. So um, my story today is very simple, it's essentially around three words, and the words are competitiveness, competitiveness, and competitiveness. And that's very simple, because to succeed in trade, you have to be able to compete, and you have to be able to outcompete your competitors. It's as simple as that. And I think what is important is, people say, oh, but it's not a zero-sum game, and the more the trade, 
the more we share gains of trade, and then we don't need to be necessarily competing with each other. This may be true for certain products and certain sectors. However, it is not true for many products and many sectors. You cannot double your consumption of bananas or rice overnight. The consumption of bananas or rice or cocoa is more or less going to remain the same um, over the years. So if the Kenyans are more competitive in exporting fruits, if the Cambodians are more, ex uh, more competitive in exporting rice or Cote d'Ivoire for cocoa, that is it. Caribbean firms are not going to be able to get the orders which these countries are going to get. So to be competitive, you have to have the right quality, you have to have the right price, and there is something which was perhaps not mentioned today which I think is very important, and that is the issue of reliability and consistency. Um, these are uh, key factors if you want to be able to um, um, gain, have trade gains, and if you want to be competitive. Um, I would like to focus perhaps on three areas today. Talk a little bit about trade performance and some of the numbers you have, you have mentioned today. Um, I would like to uh, also talk about some of the key competitiveness drivers in the Caribbean and look at perhaps a scorecard for those uh, drivers. And finally, I would like to suggest some measures in terms of what I believe, what are the measures which need to be taken in the medium to long term to make the Caribbean economies more competitive. So um, when it comes to trade performance, we saw, of course, uh, the boom numbers uh, today. And thank you very much. I do agree that uh, the last four years um, have been uh, extremely promising uh, for the Caribbean economies. But I am, I am, I'm a person who believes in the law of averages. And I, um, I would like to present to you perhaps some numbers and some statistics which take a 10-year um, average for many of the numbers uh, which we have seen today. And there, um, the picture actually looks um, perhaps a little bit more nuanced. Uh, first of all, I think it is common knowledge that there has been uh, increasing deglobalization as far as the Caribbean economies are concerned. In 1980, the Caribbean economies had a, had a, had, had a world, had, had, a, had a share of global trade which was approximately 0.5%. Today, it's at about 0.2%. Again, if you look at um, merchandise trade and trade in goods, uh, it is true that the last four years uh, um, have been extremely good uh, for, for the Caribbean region. But over a 10-year period, uh, trade, well, the average growth in, in trade in goods has been approximately 6.8% as compared to the, the, the average for developing countries at large which stands at about 13%. The same goes for services. If you look at services growth, um, uh, the Caribbean economies over the last eight to 10 years have had an average growth of approximately 9%, uh, whereas the developing countries at large have had an average growth, again, of 13 to 14%. Now, that being said, you are absolutely right, uh, Pamela. I think the, the services sector is the sector which holds out the greatest promise and the greatest potential for the future. And it is not necessarily tourism or travel. It is the non-traditional sectors in services which I believe uh, hold out the greatest potential. You mentioned financial services. Um, there, is, um, there, there is design services. Well, all the professional services, but particularly design, communications, marketing, uh, and financial services. Um, I think there is also, um, there is also a space uh, if you look at uh, some of the other areas, uh, for example, within tourism, there are niche service sectors like the wellness and spa uh, industry, which I believe hold out a lot of promise. Um, when it now comes to um, the issue of vulnerability, because a lot has been spoken about economic resilience today and vulnerability, it is true that um, for open economies like the Caribbean, which are highly dependent on external trade. It is going to be crucial that they have a more diversified um, export base, both in terms of products and in terms, in terms of markets. And there again, I will not go into the details, but there is an indicator called the equivalent number. And many of the econometricians here in the room might be familiar with the equivalent number. 
um, if you look again over a 10 year period, what is the equivalent number of products and the equivalent number of markets which the Caribbean region uh, has had, uh, they, they are actually amongst the lowest as compared to all the regions in the world. For example, for markets, the equivalent number is four markets, whereas for the ACP group, it is 15 markets, for the developing countries, it is 14 markets, and for, uh, for developed countries, it is 16 markets. And uh, I'm saying this because uh, it, if, if the Caribbean economies are to move on an upward uh, trajectory of growth, the issue of diversification both of products as well as markets, will need to be tackled uh, significantly. Now, coming to competitiveness, um, I would like to focus on perhaps five triggers which I think are key to, um, for competitiveness. And that is trade policy. It is a regulatory environment, as you have pointed out. It is innovation. It is productivity. And it is connectivity. And I would like to perhaps present to you, again, a bit of a scorecard on these five triggers of competitiveness, again, over a, an eight to 10 period uh, horizon. So um, looking at trade policy, um, as you know, tariff rates are an important indicator um, for, tra for trade policy. And the Caribbean region, on an average, has had a weighted average uh, in terms of tariff rates of approximately 11.6% uh, over the last 10 years. Um, now. This is obviously one of the highest amongst all the regions in the world, but more importantly, for open economies and for small economies, which are very dependent on imports uh, to be able to then export, uh, high tariff rates obviously have an impact uh, on costs uh, of inputs coming into the country. Uh, when it comes to the regulatory environment, uh, we have heard today the, the important indicators are the logistics performance index, the LPI, and the Doing Business Index. Uh, and there again, if you look at a, a, a 10 year trajectory, um, the Caribbean uh, economies have actually not really been doing uh, very well. So on the Logistics Performance Index, uh, they have been having a score of 2.4 over the last 10 years, which is again, uh, the lowest amongst all the regions in the world. But that being said, um, the LPI for 2014, has, actually for 2013, has, stands at 2.6. And that is, um, that is a much higher uh, LPI, and, uh, and it is actually uh, equivalent to the LPI for Eastern Europe and uh, for, for the Central Asian countries, and higher than that of Sub-Saharan Africa. So things are certainly changing uh, for the better. Um, we have looked at some numbers on the ease of doing business um, uh, index today, and uh, there again, I would just like to say that if you take again a 10-year uh, uh, horizon, uh, things perhaps look a little bit more uh, different. And let me give you just one example. Over a 10 year period, the Caribbean economies have, on an average, have taken 78 days um, to, um, to start a business. And this is way higher than 26 days for, for the MENA countries or 46 days for the sub Saharan uh, countries, sub Saharan African countries. I need to wrap up. So perhaps um, I will talk um, very briefly about innovation. Innovation is crucial for, for economic growth. And there again, if you look at the patent application numbers for the, for the Caribbean, they are extremely low as compared to many other regions in the world. And um, at, if you look at uh, a recent survey which was carried out on productivity, Latin American countries and firms in Latin American countries are 43% more productive than firms in the Caribbean. Of course, this has a lot to do with economies of scale um, because um, you know, of the small economies uh, here in, in the Caribbean. So this was the, the gloom and the doom story. But I, um, I stand convinced that, um, in fact, the turning point has come. There is a lot happening uh, in the Caribbean. And I think that if the right kind of measures are put in place, both by the private sector and by government, uh, we can see a very quick upward trajectory uh, in, the, in the coming years. So what needs to be done? Uh, perhaps uh, starting with the, with the public sector and with government, I do think that it is important that government realizes that they have to pick the winner products and the champion sectors. It is not possible to, do, to be all things to all people. 
So what are those four or five uh, products? And you've actually uh, identified them very well in your presentation, Pamela. I think those are the products you need to focus on, and there has to be a comprehensive strategy which needs to be implemented around those four, five, six winner products and winner sectors. Um, of course, there is a need to improve the business environment, the regulatory environment, to cut down trade costs and to attract uh, foreign direct investments. There is also a need to develop some South-South links, to look at the new growth poles, look at India, look at Brazil, look at Mexico, look at China, and see if they can become not only markets, but also partners for investments and for exchange of know-how. I think it's important to also, uh, in a way, analyze uh, opportunities under the EPA, opportunities under the common market, but also opportunities for future membership under the NAFTA or Mar Mercosur. And these opportunities need to be looked at very closely and, and you need to find out what does it mean uh, in terms of um, products and sectors. Um, we haven't spoken much about institutions today. We have the Caribbean Development um, Agency here. It is key that business support organizations all across the Caribbean are strengthened. Under the leadership of Caribbean Export, I think there is a need for a regional TPO network and a regional network of chambers of commerce for the Caribbean region, and they need to increase their capacities in the area of market intelligence, and more importantly, competitive intelligence, which looks at scenarios uh, for the future. And finally, looking at firms, I would say um, it is about um, organizing the supply chain, it is about quality, it is about meeting traceability requirements, uh, it is about helping companies and firms to identify niche markets, diaspora markets, fair trade markets, whatever they may be. And the largest and the most important point in my view is to focus on SMEs, as you have pointed out, 70% of firms in the Caribbean are SMEs. SMEs need to be supported, uh, be it through access to finance, be it through skills development, or be it through innovation and giving them space um, for innovation through, through incubators. So perhaps I will end uh, by saying, Pamela, that um, you know, my, my, my sense is that um, there is a need for, uh, for a structural transformation of the economy in the long term. Uh, this will require a paradigm shift. This will require um, um, not a business as usual approach, but it will require some creative thinking um, and, and action on the ground. And as far as your initial question about the report card is concerned, I think you've been a bit, little bit harsh uh, on yourself. I think the report card <laughs> is uh, a very good C, in my view. But average, like, yes, um, average gives you a C. That's right. And um, I, I do believe that, like all parents, you have the potential, yes. as they say to their children, to go very quickly uh, to a B plus. <laughs> and you have everything going for the moment to make it to a B plus. So on, tho on, on, those, on, on that note, thank you very much um, for, for your patience. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Ashes, for a very interesting um, intervention um, where you emphasized the, the triggers of competitiveness and, um, and the need to focus on winners, uh, thinking nevertheless always about a paradigm shift. Um, I would like now to, to pass the, the floor to, to Vessel Stewart for a little brief intervention, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. I, you. I note your comment in brief. Um, I will speak, as you'll anticipate, on the, the matter of the food sector. Um, first, to note that Pamela has actually established our evaluation scorecard. And one may want to ask at the outset, who would have set the standards for the, for the card? Who would have set the targets? And in our evaluation, what would be the basis on which we make that evaluation? So that was the first issue to place on the table. Was it the public sector or the private sector? Was it the collective? 7% of total exports would be food exports. Is that good or is that bad? How does that compare with our potential? Should we be comparing that with what others have done or with what we could have done? She indicated that in terms of processed foods, we are exporting the region of 1.4 billion. Um, I mean, a fresh rather, 1.4 billion, 11% growth. Is that good or is that bad? 
processed food, 2.2 billion, 6% growth. Could we have done better? Let's drill down a little bit to look at what are the products. And we see that for processed foods, cigars, 27%, sugar, 19 alcoholic beverage, 14 cocoa, 9 sauces and condiments, 5 fruits and vegetables, 4 But cigars at 27%, is that good? Is that bad? Where does the cigar come from? How many countries benefit from that? Let's look at the fresh. Banana, supposedly a dying industry, 26%. Rice, 20 Crustaceans, 18. Fruits and vegetables, 15%. Coffee, 4 Vegetables, another 4%. Now, we don't have the time to drill down beyond that to see what are the actual products. Now, let's also look at the countries and their performance. Processed food. Which countries are actually moving the volumes that we have identified? They are 57%. Jamaica, 14. Guyana, 9. Trinidad, 8%. Belize, 6. Barbados, 4. And the rest of the OECS, 4%. How does that compare with, was there a plan? Is that consistent, again, with the capacity? In terms of fresh produce, again, if we look at who are the major players, they are 35%. Guyana, 22. Suriname, 11. Belize, 8. Bahamas, 6. Trinidad, Tobago, 4. OECS, another 4%. Again, did they set some targets, and are the targets consistent with their achievements? In terms of markets, where are we shipping to? Where, where are the export markets? US, 42% in terms of all the products now, global sense, both processed and fresh. UK, 12%. EU, interestingly, 11% combined, number of countries. CARICOM, excluding 80, 8%. Surprisingly for me, at least looking at the data, 85% of the total food export trade. What products, from where? Those are issues we need to pay a little bit more attention to, because one would not have thought that 80 would be a major market, would we? In terms of fresh produce market, again, we see a similar kind of trend. The US is the number one at 33%, um, the UK another 12%, and another surprise, Venezuela, 11%. Uh, and dig a little bit, we found that looks like rice from Guyana to, to Venezuela. So, so just a little bit of market diversification there. Again, significant exports to some of the European countries. I see, for example, a 9% to France, and I, I haven't had a chance to dig to see what that comprises of and from whence it comes. Where are the, where, where are the opportunities? Um, I mean, we are, we are doing what appears to be doing well. If it is that you're showing a growth, and I think Pam mentioned an average of about 9%, when you look at the data from 2009 to 2013, you'd have seen some fluctuation. Um, indeed, in, in, in one year, we saw as much as a 24% increase, um, particularly among the processed products. So where, where, where are the opportunities in terms of seeking to expand that? Because I would argue that notwithstanding what seems to be significant um, export growth, that if you look at what we should be doing, that's still not adequate. We see that if we were to look at the, our capacity in terms of, let's first start with comparative advantages. The Caribbean is known to have the best cocoa, the best coffee, the best ginger, the best hot pepper. Those are not anecdotal stories. Those are fat borne out by what the market is prepared to pay for these products. We see that the herbs and spice industry is growing at a <coughs> tremendous rate. And I think Pam mentioned hot pepper, just one product, $1 billion in sales, growing at 25% a year, one company, um, Tabasco. 
they are doing 2.5 million gallons of pepper per year, 750,000 bottles per day. A Caribbean, as I said before, it's all question. Let's call it peppers. Where can we go in that market? She mentioned cassava. Why? We import over 4.3 billion worth of food yearly. If you sum up the export of fresh produce and processed products, that comes to what, about 3.6 billion? So we are about 0.7 billion off the mark in terms of balances, all right? In terms of okay, opportunities, that industry provides us, I'm saying now the staples industry. It's also an export industry. Because if you look at the consumption of a tourist in terms of wheat products that they consume, let's assume we're able to get 10, 20% of our cassava or our sweet potato or plantains mixed with wheat flour that the consumer, in, in this case, a tourist consumes. That's an export market because they're paying us with their US dollars. Tremendous opportunity there. Some questions, because I see I only have a minute here. So, so let me go to some, some issues I want to raise. In going forward, how do we consolidate and how do we accelerate? What, what are the major issues? Should have indicated some constraints. Let's look at the issue of collective action. Mention what just made that, what, 70% of, of the companies are SMEs? How do you get SMEs to take collective action? How do you link them to the big players? We see, for example, Ritual's fairly recent um, company in terms of seeking to expand the market for hot beverages. In less than six years, about 80 odd stores in the region. How can we link them and the SMEs who want to do herbs and spices and, and produce the kind of products that could get into that market? How do we utilize the opportunities that could be created by our diaspora professionals who are in critical institutions and in critical companies that can give us access to market? And just very briefly to, to, to emphasize that point. Years ago, we sought to get into um, an opportunity just to speak to Marks and Spencer about some products we wanted to move from St. Lucia. And we were told there's no way we would get in to speak to them because usually you need at least three months um, advance notice and so on. And we were able to do that only because the, the person who was the buyer for that company years ago spent some time in St. Lucia, just that relationship. So there are no more, I suppose in the discourse, I could get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the strategy because I would want to make the point, in, uh, just in closing, that we have done reasonably well, but we have not done anywhere near as well as we should have, as, as we can. So the question I'm going to put to you is, what's the plan? Are we going to get from where we are to where we want to go? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to, to Vessel for the very interesting agribusiness uh, perspective. There is uh, very little doubt in my mind that we can get more out of that very promising uh, export sector, uh, including herbs, spices, etc., to the EU. Um, I would like now to pass the floor to Professor Victor Balmer Thomas, and you would have noticed that I'm getting increasingly tough when it comes to the timing. <laughs> so uh, be prepared for uh, enforcement of the five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's start with some good news, and that is there's a consensus in the Caribbean that the growth strategy should be one which uh, is often called export-led, export-led growth strategy. And that within that, there should be diversification of exports. And that may be uncontroversial in the Caribbean, but there's lots of regions in which it would be highly controversial, uh, parts of Asia, South America, even the European Union. So that is a good thing. And it's good because it actually makes it easier to assess the performance uh, looking over the last few years and to gauge how the region might be judged going forward. We've heard a lot uh, today about the region. Uh, that's a problem because in this room, the region either means CARIFORUM or CARICOM. It doesn't really mean the Caribbean. And the reason why that is a problem is because this sub-region, which is CARIFORUM or CARICOM, is dominated 
at least as far as exports are concerned, by Trinidad and Tobago. So whatever number you take when talking about the region, really all it's telling you is about Trinidad and Tobago. Take, for example, what will happen in the next five years when oil prices will probably continue to fall. It'll look as if the region, quote unquote, has had tremendous diversification of exports. But it isn't really true. It simply means that oil prices from which um, Trinidad is so dependent uh, have gone down. Similarly, in the last five years when they've been high, it looks as if there perhaps hasn't been that much diversification. But again, that's not necessarily true. So what I always try and do is look at it at the country level. And uh, I take the broadest possible view of the Caribbean. And I have, uh, in the work for this conference, I have 27 countries. The only that's the 16 independent and 11 dependencies. And the only two for which I haven't been able to get data this time are the Turks and Caicos and the British Virgin Islands, where you have to have uh, the detective skills of, uh, of uh, Hercule Poirot to find out exactly what's happening in the areas that we're interested in today. I then apply a series of uh, very simple tests. And the first test is, have the goods exports of this country, of the, each of these 27 countries, have they gone up faster than world exports of goods? If they have, they've increased their share of world exports. And of the 27, 11 countries manage that, which is not bad. Interestingly enough, Trinidad and Tobago was not one of them. So when you aggregate all, you can see that you will get a problem. Secondly, have the exports of services uh, 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 increase faster than world exports of services? In other words, has this country increased its share of world service exports? And six countries, not so good, but six uh, did manage to do that. You then have to ask, what about total exports, adding goods and services, and apply the same test? Because sadly, it's true that you could do incredibly well in goods exports, but if you're Antigua and Barbuda, that doesn't really help you very much. So you need to aggregate them together. And there we find that there are 10 countries of the 27 where goods and services, i.e. total exports, increased faster than world uh, total exports. The fourth test has to do with tourism, and in particular, whether the country was able to increase the share of overnight tourists coming from countries from the rest of the world, i.e. not from the US, Canada, and, and Europe. And there were six countries that managed to do that. And the fifth test is, uh, which countries uh, managed to increase non-travel service exports? In other words, service exports other than tourism. And four, only four of the 27 managed to do that. When you sum up those five tests, and you rank, give each country that uh, succeeds a one and, the, and every, everyone else a zero, you realize you get a maximum score of five. But looking at the top six countries, uh, those that scored three or above, i.e. three, four, or five. They were Cuba, which got a maximum score, Haiti, which got four, Dominican Republic with three, Guyana with three, Suriname with three, and the Cayman Islands with three. There are not much surprise about some of those because of the huge advantage of uh, being a mineral exporter in the case of Guyana and Suriname recently but there are some surprises about uh, the others. The trouble, of course, is that there's a long tail. There are 16 out of the 27 countries which should score one or less, and there are 10 which score zero. In other words, they don't perform, they get a zero on every single uh, one of those indicators. Now, it might be argued that this is too tough a test given where the region is at this particular moment and, and all the rest of it. So I apply another test, which is, well, what about, uh, uh, have exports of goods and services risen faster than GDP? In other words, has there been export-led growth? Even if it's been rather modest, both in terms of exports and in terms of GDP, has there at least been an increase in the share of uh, exports, total exports in GDP in the last five years? And the answer is for 17 of the 27, there has. And that, I think, is a very important lesson because it means that the message coming out of Caribbean export and all sorts of other places is definitely being listened to. Now, that means there are still 10 where uh, the export uh, to GDP ratio has been falling, but there are 17 where it's been uh, rising. <laughs> to conclude, I think we can say that export-led growth has, uh, the message has been 
uh, receive loud and clear, even if it's still the case that exports, whether of goods or services or both, has not yet been fast enough. And that's clearly in part what this conference has all been about. Secondly, there have been some diversification uh, successes, uh, both in terms of the, the goods or the services that countries have managed to uh, produce, but also in terms of selling to other regions, uh, uh, <coughs> and to non-traditional markets, all that sort of stuff. Uh, what is clear, though, is that there has to be a much greater effort put into the measurement or the metrics by which the performance of countries in the Caribbean is judged. And here I really think that uh, Caribbean export has a large role to play. I am very skeptical about these international indicators mm -hmm. and their relevance to countries in the Caribbean for two reasons. The first is that most countries in the Caribbean don't actually produce the numbers that allow them to be in this. So when people say, oh, three of the Caribbean countries are in the top 100, well, that doesn't tell you very much because there's probably only seven countries in the Caribbean out of the 27 that actually produce it. So you're not really learning very much. And secondly, in countries which are inevitably high cost in terms of uh, labor and welfare and energy, it's probably, they're probably going to reflect badly in these sorts of indicators. So I think the, uh, the Caribbean can't literally opt out because that would be taken very badly. But they have, the Caribbean countries, led perhaps by Caribbean export, need to develop alternative indicators by which each country in the Caribbean, not the region as a whole, but each country in the region can be judged year on year as to whether it has improved its export performance, both in relation to its own past and relation to other countries in the region. I think that'll be a far better test uh, than learning that Jamaica jumped 27 places uh, last year. And what happens when next year it goes down 27? Are we all going to, you know, frankly, nothing much will have changed. Uh, it's not that uh, dramatic. These indicators are not that cleverly put together. So I don't think one should be too excited about them. Um, and finally, a point that, uh, came up uh, this morning uh, at our breakfast meeting, uh, which was another role that uh, Caribbean export can play. And that is that when you get down to the really specific issues, and the one, one we were talking about this morning is the sourcing by hotels like this of their uh, food supply, particularly fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, it's obviously a scandal that it's all imported um, via Miami. Everybody knows that, but nobody quite knows what to do. And clearly, you need to bring all the stakeholders together in, in, in one place over a period of days and to actually work out where the specific bottlenecks are. Because there's manifestly goodwill on the part of the hotels and everybody else to try and do something about it. So it's not that there is a sort of ideological opposition or anything like that. And you just need a broker, in this case, perhaps uh, Caribbean Export, to, to play that role. Thanks. Um, Victor, I do not agree with you when you said that the, the indices and the tests are not that clever. Uh, I think they're very clever. And I would really like you to leave a trace behind you in terms of the test that you mentioned uh, so that we can all benefit from that as a, as a reference in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.